You are in the emergency department on one fine night when you see a patient with 60 year old male who is diabetic, hypertensive and smoker. He has presented to you with worsening shortness of breath for the last three days. You've got a great team of healthcare professionals. You jump on to do the primary survey, you take the history, you go for the examination and you use the point of care adjuncts to reach to a diagnosis. Now one of your seniors gets the ECG and yells out the patient has got an LBBB. What the heck is an LBBB? And when does it occur? We'll see this in this particular video. Now before we delve into the LVBB, you must know the electrical conduction which normally happens in the heart and the various components of the same. This cartoon demonstrates the flow of electrical conduction from the SA node to the AV node to the bundle of his through the bundle branches into the ventricles. Now if you have to understand the details of the normal conduction, uh, there is a separate video for that and you can see the link in the description below. Now how does normal ECG generation happens after the formation of the P wave? Since the first deflection is towards the lead, we have a small positive deflection and then there is a net deflection away from the lead. So we got a negative deflection followed by a repolarization. So this is a normal QRS complex in a V1. On the right sided lead, this could be V1 or V2. On the left sided lead, just the opposite happens. We see the first negative deflection away from the uh, lead. Then we find a significant positive deflection because the net deviation or the net direction of the current is towards the lead followed by a repolarization. So, after this, we need to understand the LBBB conduction abnormality. So, what is the physiology? As demonstrated in this particular uh, cartoon, the left bundle branch is blocked. The current passes down the AV node through the right bundle branch in, into the right ventricle. The septum depolarizes from right to the left side. So, this is the first ECG uh, event, uh, electrical event. The next event which happens is the ventricular depolarization of the right ventricle we can call it 2A, which is soon followed by an aberrant conduction 2B of the left ventricle. So how does this have implications on the surface ECG? So since there is an aberrant conduction, an aberrant prolonged depolarization, it leads to longer duration of depolarization leading to QRS widening. That is one of the manifestations of an LBBB morphology. Now, how does this appear on the right sided leads is the formation of a P wave which is unaffected followed by a small negative deflection because of the uh, depolarization which is away. Then there is a small positive deflection because of the right ventricular depolarization followed by a deep negative depolarization of the right left ventricle. However, on the other side, that is the left sided leads V5, V6, lead 1 and lead AVL, the depolarization manifestation is totally different. Here you see that after the P wave, there is a loss of a septal wave because now the uh, uh, depolarization of the septum occurs from right to left side. So this leads to a positive deflection here, a small negative deflection because of the ventricular depolarization followed by a positive R wave by loss of septal Q waves in lateral leads. Third important finding is presence of a prominent R wave V5, V6, 1 or AVL that is the right left sided leads. Now mind you the time difference between 2A and 2B can vary which leads to different manifestations on the QRS. So it could be something like this, it could be something like this. So various QRS morphologies can be seen. The undercurrent of all of them is a prominent R wave. Similarly, uh, when you extrapolate these all findings towards V2 and V3, the morphologies can vary in the form of something like this. This could be just a deep and wide S wave. The fourth important finding is presence of a deep and wide S wave in lead V1, V2 that is the right sided leads. Now this is a typical ECG you will find. You will see that the QRS is wide here more than 120 milliseconds. You can see that there is no septal Q wave 
in V6, lead 1, and AVL, which are the left sided leads. There is a prominent S wave in the uh, V1 and V2 leads, and then there is a prominent R wave in the uh, left sided leads, not this one, the left sided leads, right? V6, lead 1, AVL. So, this basically is a uh, ECG which is typical of a left bundle branch block. Now, just recapitulating the diagnostic criteria, the QRS width, absence of Q waves, prominent R waves and a dominant S wave in late to leads and V1 respectively. Now, but there could be some associated features, some ECG features which are present in addition to these findings in a patient with left bundle branch block. Now, if you see the heart again, bulk of the current moves towards the left because the depolarization of the left ventricle is delayed and aberrant. So, most of the current, you know, gets more shifted in the leftward direction leading to a left axis deviation. Now, what is a ventricular axis? What is a depolarization axis? What is right and left axis deviation? How to calculate the axis? All these are an important part of a basic ECG interpretation. And we've got a separate video on that. The link is in the de description below. You can check that out. Now, after the left axis deviation, many etiologies of left bundle branch block, which we'll see subsequently, also lead to the left ventricular hypertrophy. So you can sometimes see the voltage criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy met in these patients. Now this leads to a pressure overload for the left atrium, which leads to the left atrial enlargement, which is manifestation manifested in by the changes in the P wave. Again, a separate video on atrial enlargements and chamber enlargements in general. It's a very important aspect of routine ECG interpretations. Do check the link in the description for uh, understanding the atrial and ventricular enlargements further. Now, what is the appropriate discordance which I've mentioned here is an important thing to understand. A discordance means that the ST and T move away from the direction of prominent QRS deviation, which means that to make it simple, if the QRS complex is predominantly positive, the ST and T wave will go into below the baseline, which is there would be an ST depression and T wave inversion. If the predominant QRS deviation is negative, then there would be an associated ST elevation and a prominent T wave, which is demonstrated here. Since the QRS is positive here, there is an ST depression and T wave inversion. Since the QRS is negative here, there is an ST elevation and a prominent T wave. Now, why does this happen? Because there is an abnormality, an aberrancy in the depolarization, there is an abnormality in the repolarization as well, which leads to these secondary repolarization changes in the form of STT deviations. Mind you, these are not the primary uh, uh, changes because of the primary pathology of the ST and T segments. It is secondary to the depolarization abnormalities, which brings us to an important consideration of cardiac ischemia. Now, cardiac ischemia manifests itself in the form of ST elevations or ST depressions, T wave inversions or prominence. Now, since you have seen previously that because of the secondary repolarization abnormalities, there could be ST elevations and ST depressions in patients with left bundle branch block. So it makes it difficult for, the uh, for us to diagnose cardiac ischemia in presence of left bundle branch block. Now, how to diagnose? There are various techniques for that. There's a difference, uh, uh, different approach through which you can uh, diagnose cardiac ischemia in the presence of left bundle branch block, uh, uh, which requires a detailed discussion. And I've covered it separately in one of the videos. And I'll make a separate video uh, discussing about the special situations in which uh, how to diagnose cardiac ischemia on a surface ECG. You may find one or more of these findings on an ECG in a patient who is presented to you with a left bundle branch block. You will come across a term called incomplete bundle branch block, which is nothing but all the criteria are met except that the QRS duration is not wide enough. So the QRS is still less than 120 milliseconds, but all the other criteria are met. This ECG typically demonstrates a typical incomplete left bundle branch block. You will see that there is no septal Q wave. There is a prominent R wave in the lateral leads. There is a prominent S wave in V1 and V2. But the QRS complex is not wide. It is less than 120 milliseconds. 
So this ECG typically demonstrates an incomplete left bundle branch block pattern. Now what could lead to an LBBB? If you see any LBBB in the emergency department, you should first think about an acute cardiac ischemia. Now, cardiac ischemia and LBBB have got a very you know intertwined relationship. An acute cardiac ischemia can lead to a new onset left bundle branch block. Or a patient with LBBB can have an ongoing ischemia. So LBB could be a baseline ECG. Now the patient develops an acute ischemia. But when you see a new onset LBBB, if you got a patient's baseline ECG, which is normal and does not have an LBBB, patient presents to you with an, some acute symptoms and you'd see that the patient's got a new onset left bundle branch block, the alarm should go off and you should think in the direction of an acute cardiac ischemia. So very important thing to understand. Other causes can be a long-standing ischemic heart disease, systemic hypertension, dilated cardiomyopathy, aortic stenosis, all these can lead to remodeling of the left ventricle, altering the conduction pathways in the left ventricular side, leading to left bundle branch block patterns. Hyperkalemia is a very notorious uh, electrolyte abnormality. It can lead to almost any EC change known to us. And, you know, it can lead to a right bundle branch block pattern. It can lead to a left bundle branch block pattern. It can affect the STT segments in very different ways and it can mimic cardiac ischemia as well. So whenever you see any abnormalities which are not explained typically by a particular pattern and you find that the ECG is somewhat bizarre, always think about hyperkalemia. And an interesting concept is the right ventricular pacing in which what happens is the pacing lead is placed in the right ventricle and this is the one which acts as a pacemaker. Now the right, right ventricle depolarizes fast but the left ventricle depolarizes slowly and aberrantly. We can actually call it a condition of iatrogenic LBBB. So this ECG is a typical one which is seen in the uh, uh, right ventricular pacing in which you see uh, the pace of spikes, the small positive and negative uh, lines just before the QRS complex, which you can see, these are the ventricular pacer spikes. This is a dual chamber pacer in this particular patient, so we can also see the atrial spikes here, just preceding the P wave. Now, but if you focus on the ventricle depolarization, that is the QRS complexes, you see that they are wide QRS complexes. There is a deep S wave in V2. You may not find positive R wave in lateral leads, which is typical for left bundle branch block. But because of these findings of deep S-wave, wide QRS complexes, this can easily be confused with left bundle branch block if you do not pay attention to the pacer spikes. So if you see these pacer spikes, you will be able to diagnose the condition of right ventricular pacing. So these are some of the common etiologies in which you can see the left bundle branch block morphology on a surface ECG. If you enjoyed this video and understood quite a lot about how left bundle branch block is relevant in the emergency ECGs, do hit the like button. Also subscribe to the channel ECG Sadhana for more such interesting videos and do keep coming back to learn more. Thank you.